welcome you back. I know a lot of you were at the first session I did this morning. How many people have been either to the first or the second session we've had so far? I know some faces are familiar, others are not. You were there, I saw you. That's familiar. Okay, so how many people this is the first time? First session you've attended. Well, I want to welcome you all to our session. What we're doing today in this session is we are talking about how do you evaluate your instruction? How do you evaluate? What is evaluating? What does that mean? And what if what you're doing isn't working? Now, I'm sorry if I have, I tried to, I usually don't type in, um, use uh, contractions in the English language. If you don't know what the contractions are in my slides, I apologize for that. Doesn't is does not. Do together. So yes. Um, so the way we're going to do it is we're going to start, and I want to give you a workshop, this overview for this. So what we're going to be doing is I want to talk to you a little bit about what we call the scholarship of teaching and learning. And how, what is evaluation? How does it concern the scholarship of teaching and learning? Has anybody ever heard of the term scholarship of teaching and learning? It may be a very U.S. thing, but it is something that helps you figure out what you're doing and also give credence to what you're going to be doing with your course so that it can help you justify it to either your supervisors, your chairs, your other faculty members, things like that, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, I'm also going to talk about why you should plan evaluations. And then I'm going to go into a lot of detail to go from a course that I actually taught. Okay, that's not a fire alarm. All right. Anyway, it sounds like a fire alarm for a little bit. <laughs> Anyway, so it's, what is an example from my previous course? What, when I set goals, I didn't really do a good job with it. Because that was before I learned how to set goals and what to do with it. And so, okay. Okay. Sorry, there's a sign there that shouldn't be doing it. It's just like a bullet. Then I want to talk about creating what I call an evaluation table. I'm actually going to do that with you guys in for my course, but then I want to have you guys break up into an activity and start coming up with what are some goals that you have come up with for your class, maybe from what you did with Jeff last, last workshop, or something you're just thinking about your course and what do you mean by goals and what you could do. Then I'm going to actually have you do, I'm going to go over some different methods for evaluating courses, ideas of what are some things that are working, what aren't. I'm going to also focus on what are the traditional end of the course evaluations, what if they say this, and then, what if your evaluations are showing poor results? What's going on? How do we, act? if it's not working, what do we need to do to fix it? So we have suggestions like that as we go along. Before I get started, are there any questions? I gotta turn around. Hands will go up as I turn around. I learned this. Okay, I'm gonna get really dizzy here. If I'm not careful. All right, no questions. Whoa, I am a little dizzy. All right. So I want to talk about this idea of scholarship, and I'm going to trip again, scholarship of teaching and learning. This is a term that actually started by the work, mm, there was a work, um, was when they were, re, it was in a book called Reconsidering Scholarship, and it was by the Carnegie Foundation. And one of the things they focused is on what type of scholarship are we as faculty doing. So some of the scholarship is definite research scholarship. Other types of, um, in like in doing research and creating new knowledge and things like that. Another type of scholarship they said is, well, we're professors. We're, we're, we're intelligent. We're, we all have PhDs. We're very close to it. What does it mean we should be looking at our teaching and learning in a scholarly manner? How do we actually approach teaching and learning in a scholarly manner? The fact that you are in this room right now means you're already taking the first step to doing that. Because you're looking at figuring, well, how do I do this? Why am I doing What's the right way to do it? What are things doing on? What can I learn to do this? And things like that. So that's why the scholarship of teaching and learning. I'm trying to see. I'm, what's that? My phone's up. I just am checking. I can, hear, I can hear some feedback from my speaking that's not from my ears. Somebody has it loud. Eh, quisiera I, I want to ask to answer your question. Yes. Voy, voy a responder la pregunta. Creo que una manera de hacer, eh, de aproximarse a esta scholarship of teaching and learning es 
convirtiendo nuestros problemas del aula en una pregunta de investigación. I think the way to do that is becoming the problem the problems we have in our classrooms into a research question. That's the first thing we should do to do that. Like yes. See in the United States we have these programs where you have individuals that work in colleges of education that may be concerned with more elementary, pre-elementary, high school teaching. And then what do we do when students come to college? So as I mentioned in the first one, uh, myself, Jeff Saul, and Luana Gomez, we all are, um, we actually participate in what's called discipline-based education research. So we received our PhDs within our discipline, i.e. physics, in my case physics and astronomy, and, but we focused our research on the pursuit of looking at research questions. So you had to have a PhD in the science or the discipline to be able to actually understand where the students are having difficulty with. And that's why they started bringing it in. Um, and so uh, it started about 40 years ago, maybe 45 years ago. Um, and we are now coming along with it. But so scholarship of teaching, learning, and discipline-based education research, they're like two sides to the same coin. Scholarship of teaching and learning may not have as much underlying theory to it as well as, although they are working to increase the amount of underlying theory in it, uh, where um, research in science education really does have, or discipline-based education research has a lot of theory in it, and we're actually developing theories. But the scholarship of teaching and learning, basically the idea is, let's think about our teaching and learning in a very thoughtful manner so that it's there and we can figure out what's happening. Are we okay with this? Going around, turning my circle. As I don't trip, I'll fall flat on my face if I trip. Okay, so that's coming in. So, as I said, this is just restating what I just said. They also refer to scholarship of teaching and learning. The acronym that they do is, is SOTL, S-O-T-L. Now, did you know that every, you know, all the projects we're talking about doing and implementing into our classroom and doing things like that, do you know that you could actually publish your scholarly work that you do on your course in journals for scholarship of teaching and learning? There's also conferences you can go to and share your scholarship of teaching and learning. I mean, most of those are in the United States, but I think there are other, probably just because SOTL by its very nature is a uh, United States uh, developed idea. Yeah. But it's a way that people can share their ideas, meet with other teachers, find out how can I, I'm doing this in my classroom. It seems to be working, but I want to be able to evaluate it better. Or this is something that I saw you were doing in your class. Can I, how can I implement it? So in a part of the sense of what we are doing today is Claudia and Monica came to us and said, we have this idea. Can, and I said, oh, we can help you with it by doing what we've decided to do for the next two days. That we can help you out and figure this out. So, like that. Okay. Evaluation. Now, in the last session, Jeff was co covering what assessment is. I unfortunately had to step out because I needed to finish up the slides for this. But the evaluation is different than assessment. Assessment is what you do for students. You assess how your students are learning, how well they're doing in class. It's a one-to-one -one thing directly, and you provide that feedback to your students. Evaluation is taking a step back and saying, how well am I doing? How well is my course doing? How well is this, this thing that I've created? How well is that doing? So it sort of steps out, and a lot of times people confuse these, because they'll start talking about um, assessment or evaluation, and they use them left and right. And like, um, I participated in Purdue University's Project Impact a few years ago, which we've talked about before here. Not here, but it's a professional development thing for how to become, oh, incorporate active learning and student-centered learning into your classroom. So it sounds a little bit familiar. And they got up there and they give this whole big talk on assessment. What everybody wanted to know in the, in the cohort of people that are working at is how do we evaluate our project? How do we know if we're doing a good job? And they said, oh, we'll handle that, we'll handle that. And they never told us how we did. So how are we supposed to improve? So this is how what you can do and figure out what is going on so that you can be doing continual improvement to your course, because that's key. You wouldn't just repeat a study once or repeat one thing or find one source 
or do something like that in your scholarly work. You'd be looking at, you do repetitions, you do trials, you try and figure out what you did wrong and what you did right. And so that is what we're continuing with. Okay, so this is a natural partnership. Because in both cases, you're looking at it in a very thoughtful way. How can I do this? What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? Starting this question. Okay, the thing is with evaluation, when you look at the evaluation right now, wh when does evaluation in your course happen? Do we have some ideas? I'm going to turn my ears on. So when does evaluation in your course happen? What's that? What is since planning? Desde la planeación de la clase. That's where it should be, but is that always where it happens? What about some others? Where, who evaluates your course right now? Students. What was that last part? Students at the end of the course. Other ideas? Or other questions about that? Do we? Yes, yes. You can also have students evaluate you in mid-course. Uh, when you're giving them feedback, to the, for them to give you also feedback. So we could time. have, when we're giving them feedback in mid-course, they could also give us feedback. What about some other things? I mean, have you guys actually consciously evaluated your courses? Well, after each session, you should, like, self-assess your own I mean, performance in each of the classes. When you plan an activity, you should see, like, how your students respond to it and see if it worked or it didn't. That's a very good idea. She wants to say is that at the, at, throughout your course, you should be self-assessing how well you think you're doing as well as how are the students reacting <coughs> to what you're doing. So, example, if you implement an activity, almost in a sense, can't, um, can't, um, sorry, continuing a journal format where you actually go in and you actually write down right afterwards what it is that you're doing successfully. What are some other kind of evaluations that you might be doing, or anything like that with evaluation? I'm turning around. We all know. Hands go up when I turn around. Uh, no questions. Yes, there is a question. You may, have, you may have something like a forum and have the students participate and give you feedback or their comments and their opinions on things. I take that as feedback. Yes, mm -hmm. you get feedback on what you're doing from your students. We're going to talk about a little bit more formal evaluations, things, but all of these are good ideas. So one of the things I want to talk about, and somebody picked up on this earlier, you should start at the very beginning. Uh, sorry to quote. Julie Andrews in the Sound of Music, you should start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Um, and what is going on is this idea of saying, how do we actually do this? You need to plan at the beginning. You have to start sooner, you have to do it beforehand. Because what you have to do is start listing your goals. Like in the last session, you guys all were talking about course goals and how you assess students on your course goals. Or maybe you did on individual objectives. What I'm talking about is going back a step and saying, these are my goals for my course. Now, I don't know about you guys, but pers um, where I used to teach in the United States and where I've taught before, one of the things we had to do was give out syllabi or syllabus at the beginning of the course. And in that syllabus, we had to address what our goals were for the, control the course and what students were expected to improve, what the course is helping them to actually improve on. At my old university, we actually had these seven, seven types of different types of learning that all College of Arts and Science students had to learn. And since astronomy was in the College of Arts and Sciences, we had to address this. And we'll get to that in a minute. So the basic thing here is, OK, start by listing your goal. Second thing, brainstorm how do you actually evaluate this. Now, and what evidence you might need. What is evidence you're doing this? Think of what you're doing is like with any research project or any kind of scholarly work, you're trying to present something that's to make, create an artifact that says, what is my evidence that this is working? What is my evidence? Why is the thing is? And notice the evidence should probably not just be your own opinion, but you should work with uh, groups and organizations to help 
do that. So you can actually say, OK, I'm in this course. You can actually form, say the three of you decide to form a team learning environment, a team instructor environment. And you each three go into each other's courses. And you give feedback on how well the courses are going and things like that. And sort of say, this is what I observed. This is what you're doing right. This is what you may want to improve on, things like that. And you can start forming those kind of teams. That's another way to get evaluation from outside. Or you could have a peer in your own department come in. Or you could have your department chair, um, the person in charge of your department, come in and evaluate you. So you sort of need to be thinking about what are these ev artifacts of evidence. OK, so I'm going to give you an, keep track of time, um, a synopsis of an example of a course I taught, what I did right and what I did wrong. So um, I taught the introductory one semester astronomy course for non-technical majors, quaintly referred to as Astronomy 101 throughout the country, throughout the US. About 250,000 people throughout the US take this course every year. It's one of our most popular science courses. Students are not as intimidated by astronomy, partially we think because it's a very visual science. They've seen pictures of it. They've heard about Hubble Space Telescope. They've heard about the solar eclipse coming in the United States. Um, which I'm betting you guys don't know there's a solar eclipse because it hasn't been the one and be all do all thing that's been all over the news. But, you know, I'm doing this course. I've taught it for 10 years. I've been fairly excited. My student learning, I was, it was just amazing how much my students learned. So, but things I covered in this course is like basically some basic, it started with unit one with tools of science and astronomy. Well, then I went to unit two was naked eye observing. What can we learn from observing? with our naked eye in the night sky. We're not just the night sky, in the daytime sky, too. And then what can we do with the science of astronomy? Like, once we get telescopes and spectroscopy and photography, what else can we learn? And then finally, modern astronomy is uh, modern astronomy where you get into, hey, let's understand stars and galaxies. What do we mean by the Big Bang Theory? What do we mean about the expansion of the universe? What is happening? So this is a basically what we call a survey course. A little bit of everything spread out as much as we can get into a very short period of time. And as I said, it's very traditional. Uh, it's a very common course taught in the United States. So what I did in my course, they met twice a week for one and a half hours at each time. This is common in the United States where sometimes the course is uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour each day, or it's going as Tuesday, Thursday, an hour and a half at each time. And they sort of alternate the courses so that the classrooms are filled the whole time, and you still get the three credit hours of learning. So my course had about 80 students. Actually, the reason it had 80 students was because there were 80 chairs in the classroom. And I maxed out almost every semester. I also taught in what I came to eventually realize was an integrated lecture and lab environment, um, where it was about 30% lecture and 70% interactive uh, student-centered instruction, where they would work through activities and work in teams, and they come back together, and they, then we'd come back as a group, we'd sort of verify what they're getting, sort of invent concepts, see what's happening, and then go on to applications, and then going forward with that. Um, we had four exams in a final, and homework was due weekly, and in-class team assignments were taught where everybody on the team got the same score. I could talk to you more about that. I'm going to talk more about this when I talk about um, the lecture, when I talk about in the, how to do incorporating uh, student-centered learning in a lecture room, where you don't have nice chairs like this, you can't easily move around. How do you make it work? Because you can make it work. It's scary, but you can make it work. Okay. So here's where I started going a little wrong. This sounded beautiful to me. You probably all have something similar to this. OK, my course goal, I want to foster and appreciate astronomy and the scientific method. I want students to just appreciate what it means to do science. Sound like a common goal? Have you guys had goals like this where you want to say, we can insert, um, you know, what do you teach? Languages. OK, I want to foster an appreciation of languages. Is that a common thing to say? What about some other people? Let's see. OK. Machine design. Machine design. 
I want to do this appreciation of not only machine design, but possibly, possibly the design pr process. It seems like a great comment and a great goal. Second goal, I'm going to enhance my students' understanding of astronomy. I, I want them to learn something. I want them to come across and learn something. And then I want to encourage development of interpersonal and reasoning and technological skills. So if you notice the things in the parentheses, this is what we had to do. We had to see what aspects of this type of learning that were desired for all graduates of College of Arts and Sciences had to have. So we do this for each one of our classes. So the first one is lifelike learning. Second was knowledge and integration. So knowledge was one, and then integration and application of said knowledge. Then we got uh, encouraged development of interpersonal skills. So you got communication, self-development, and citizenship. Uh, when you talk about reasoning, then you're talking about critical thinking and problem framing and solving and technology skills. Um, knowledge and integration and application. So it all fitting together. And so you sort of, you had to come up with these goals in my old university so they would fit in the sign of framework. Now, does anybody see anything weird about these goals? What? They're extremely difficult to measure. Yes, you are 100% correct. Because the question you need to be asking yourself is, how am I going to measure this? How am I going to evaluate how I'm doing on each one of these goals? That was not a concern when I was working with this because we hadn't had professional development opportunities where people were coming to play and saying, hey, you should be aware of your course objectives and thinking about your evaluation plan. That was sort of played down because uh, we didn't have a wonderful um, Center for Instructional Excellence or anything like that. So what I started doing is I started breaking this down into a table. And this is called an evaluation table. And we're going to go over it a little bit more. Um, so I start with a goal. You start with a goal, then you want to talk about how you are, how to evaluate and what is the evidence you're going to collect. Okay, so for example, I wanted to do fostering appreciation of astronomy and science. And the way I did this was determine how students' attitudes and how much they appreciation has changed over the course. What did I use? I used our standard end of the semester teaching evaluations. I modified them so that I could actually see how well they, how well what of the different aspects of the course, what I would often ask them is, how much did this different aspect contribute to your learning of the material? You know, and seeing where those are comparing. Does this sound like a good idea? Sounds good on paper. Not quite. What's an at how do we measure an attitude? If we use something like this to measure an attitude, what's the number one thing that can affect end of course uh, evaluations, or one of the things that can affect the end of course evaluations? Final grades. Final grades. What's the other one? Empathy. What? Empathy with the teacher. Empathy with the teacher. We're sort of getting right there, close there. La interacción entre los entre los aprendices. Interaction between the students. What are some other ideas? Well, a big thing in the United States and other countries is the over reliance on that these are not end of the semester evaluations are not reliable evidence because they are greatly influenced by things like uh, popularity of the person in charge. You might be, oh, you're a really great guy, you're doing this thing. Also, stereotypes. So for example, um, as a female physicist, like if you met me on the side of the road, would you think I'm a physicist and I could tell you all about the stars and skies and things? Maybe, maybe not. It just depends on what you're used to with meeting these folks. So a lot of these issues like in, oh, sorry, excuse me. Rebecca, I, I want to ask you something, but it's related with the goal. Because when you read the goal, the goal is your goal as professor, not the goal of the student. Because at the end of the course, the student will be able to foster. It's not the student. It's your goal. Right. This so is all about my goal. Because the stuff that you did with assessment and their goals are different. 
Now, one of your goals could be to meet the expectations of the students. Okay. But what I'm trying to focus is on what I can do in my class and what I am trying to say is an evaluation goal for my course. So it's about what I'm setting is what I think my course is going to do. Because I've designed this course to hopefully achieve these goals. Other questions? Yes, sorry. So to me, the concept of scholarship and teaching and teaching and learning is quite new. So I'm trying to understand how it fits here and how I see it is it's, a, it's an opportunity to capture all those lessons learned in your teaching experience and then sharing them with others. Is that correct? Like that's part of, yes, that's okay. a big part of it. So here we start thinking about what is evidence. What can I do? You're brainstorming in a sense. The second goal is to enhance student understanding of astronomy concepts. Do I think my students are learning? How can I prove my students are learning? What do you think? Just, it's like, court, you can do, I can look at course grades. If majority of my students get A's and B's, they're learning, right? That only works if you respect the integrity or people respect your integrity as a professor. Some people think, oh, you're doing this open student-centered learning. You're not doing teaching like you should be. You should be getting up there and lecturing. You should be saying these kind of things, and you're wasting time by having students work together on problems. They should do that at home, not here in the classroom. And so there's this confusion of, well, are your course grades equivalent? And the answer is, well, you either have to figure out if they are, which you can do, and you also figure out, I will say, my, my one small caveat to this is, when you're talking about student-centered, active learning-based classrooms, they think you're not teaching enough because you're not lecturing. Research after research after research shows that students who are participating in these active learning, student-centered environments learn so much more than the students who go through the typical lecture. Yes, we're not going to have that top ten, one or two people that can necessarily go through it. They're going to learn no matter what you do. So they're still there. But in the stead, what you're doing is you're bringing up this whole population that may not actually master science and bringing them up so that they can actually master the content. So that's my caveat about things on those subjects. But um, one of the things we do in physics and astronomy and other STEM disciplines is we actually have standardized tests that are research-based, that are developed to measure things like conceptual understanding. And so we can deliver those in at the beginning of the course and at the end of the course, and you can assess how much did students learn versus how much could they have learned, what percentage of the amount did they, did they learn to, how much they could have learned. And then I can compare that with courses across the country who also took that. So if they're saying, oh, your course grades are so much, I say, well, here's this national instrument. Um, the astronomy diagnostics test, and my students are scoring better than about 80 to 90 percent of the student population that's been contributing to this. Chemistry actually has us all beat in the STEM disciplines. They actually have, the American Chemical Society has an accredited test, the professional organization spends a great deal in time and effort creating each year and then administering to any ACS, American Chemical Society, accredited undergraduate program so that every single ACS course across the country is assessed on the same on the same instrument and you can see how well you're doing as compared to other schools that I will say when doing these kind of instruments they don't they don't exist for everything there are some alternatives we're going to talk about in a little bit but one of the things that's happening with is they don't exist for everything and what do you do if it doesn't exist? And that's a little bit trickier. So part of it's, if one of the things is finding it. Okay, then my next one, if I figured, hey, yeah, I've got this going on. I'm, I'm figuring this stuff out. Okay, to encourage development of interpersonal skills. How do you assess the development of interpersonal skills? You guys know? I don't know. That's why there's a big, giant question mark there. I'm like... Because I was never asked these last two columns. I just said, what was my goals? So then there's the thing of encourage development of reasoning skills. I got that one. 
there's a test that I can give before and after instruction to see, it's called the Classroom Test of Scientific Reasoning or the Lawson Test for those that are familiar with it. Um, and what you do is you give it at the beginning of the class and you give it at the end and you see how much gain they had, how much they learned as compared to how much they could have learned and see, or how much they improved versus how much they could have improved. And we can measure that. And then I have this encouraging development of technological skills. Again, I can say, well, how much, the only thing I'm asking is, can I determine how much their technology skills have improved through the course? Any ideas how to assess that? Yeah. You start to talk, I'll point you out. <laughs> so really, it's one of those big question marks. And as I started looking, and that's the reason I did this as an example, because I had not learned about this method, because I wasn't doing a lot of evaluation work back when I was a professor and teaching courses all the time. Now I do a lot more of evaluation work. This is stuff I do on my, when I'm called in to be an evaluator on an on a education project. What are your goals? How are you going to assess it? You have to set this table up for every single project I work on every single course, every single project. So um, this is what I would do if I wrote it today. Uh, slight changes, I talk about, um, I talk about, instead for attitudes, I actually use the Colorado Learning About Science Survey, or CLAS, which again is one of these research-based, valid and reliable instruments that measure student attitudes toward science. Now, each one of these, Research-based instruments take two to three years to create, or up to five years. So you can't just, you can ask your own questions, you can use evidence, but again, you're only supporting your own, you know, you're choosing what the questions are. But you could bring in somebody else to do some external evaluation, and they can do it. So you're, you could do something and evaluate it for, using you guys as an example, the, the three of you, wherever the third one went, <laughs> um, doing that. Um, so uh, doing understanding of astronomy, that's pretty much the same. But one thing I did, I do nowadays that if we don't ha have a concept, we call them concept inventories or conceptual learning assessment instruments available for the subject I'm doing, I do what's called primary trait analysis. And primary trait analysis actually comes out of the humanities. Okay, I need a marker. So primary trait analysis. I hope I'm writing big enough and dark enough because this does not seem very dark to me. What's that? The green one is hard to see from the new one to try with the blue. Thank you. Okay. Sorry for my messy writing. So when it, what this means is you basically have to identify what is a primary trait. And then what you do, and I'll explain what a primary trait here is in a second. And then what you do is you figure out all things that contribute to this primary trait that you've assessed your students on. And then you add those score together and figure out on average how what, and all the student, you basically do it for an individual student, you get what they're, how they scored on this primary trait and then you actually add everybody together to score to score how the entire course scored on this primary trait. And then um, you look to see, are you doing a good job, i.e., are you doing above 70%. But so what are examples of primary traits? Well, in physics, one of the easiest things is, you know those, all those course objectives you uh, did in the last session, that you worked with Jeff to do in the last session? All of those can be primary traits. So, for example, to understand phases of the moon, I expect my students to have a mental model to both justifies and predicts uh, the phases of the moon, or explains and predicts the phases of the moon. I've assessed it using 
Question seven, eight, and nine on homework number three. I've also asked exam questions on this, on the final and on the exams. And I also asked, answered ASS uh, activities that they did in class. I take all those scores, add them up, and I say, okay, this is the total number of scores possible. And then I figure out how each student did on that. So is the, the average of the course, or the average of the students is um, 90% or that student got 90% of the stuff right, then I average out what the total course is. It's a little bit confusing. I understand. Are there questions before? I want to, um, before we're done here tomorrow, I want to have a list of references with all the proper references for some of these things I'm talking about. This idea of primary trade analysis is a big one. Because it, it is something that you can do and at least says, well, as I compare my course to what I would expect my students to be doing, I think I'm doing an okay job. Look that they're scoring above average on what I'm doing here. But the other thing you can answer is, am I doing a good job on everything? Are some topics that you're covering not so great? Another thing is, am I being too easy? So if all of a sudden you have a, a trait that the student, average student performance on is 85-90%, and that's throughout the semester. Is it, is it too easy for them? Am I not assessing it or appropriately? Should I actually increase the difficulty of my assessment? Things like that. Again, assessment and evaluation are different things. We're looking for different questions. So I want to say that's assessment scores, that you can use those assessment scores for evaluation. OK, questions. So sorry, so sorry. So when you have a 101 course like the one you gave us an example on, I take it as easier to find, and I insist on that leveling of the people in the classroom, the, the students, but when you have a higher level course that you're giving where you expect to have some prerequisites, how do you go about having a good uh, evaluation of the achievements, whether or not they started from a good level? Um, because we, we tend to see students from third to all the way up to the last semester in one given class. So how do you, how do you evaluate that? Well, part of it is you want to sort of evaluate both what they know coming in and what they know going out. Okay, that's a good and starting And so point. you may want to sort of as, uh, develop your own pretest. Sometimes things sort of like, this is what I expect you to know coming in. Are they prepared for the course? I mean, that's a good way to diagnose if they're prepared for the course. If they're not prepared for the course, maybe you can do some supplemental instruction for those groups that aren't prepared. Yes, that's up, any kind of supplemental instruction. Yes, handouts, special time, say, hey, I'm out doing a special help session. You guys want to come to it? We have this thing at Purdue called um, Signals, and they did some really good job with this. And what it is, is you can actually set, and you say, if a student is scoring below this point in the course right now, send them out a signal. And I've seen things like this done at other universities. And it sends, you get, like I had this thing, I was filling out this sheet of paper with all my students that were at risk. Now, what did they get? They get a letter from the dean of students. This is not Purdue. This is what my old school did. And they get a thing that you're failing, you're in danger of failing in class. What are you going to do? You know, you need to improve, whatever. Students come in, I'm failing. What can I do? I said, the signals doesn't do that. It actually gives you a red, green, or yellow light. Red means stop, green meaning go, yellow means you're in da danger. And it also does it in such a way that it doesn't say, oh, you're failing. It gives you, they really researched what kind of messages to send the students. And so it comes out that the students get, get this really positive reinforcement. Now, to show you that this works, um, what happened was um, I, I was working with a course in engineering mechanics for Engineering physics for or physics first semester calculus based physics for engineering majors. That's the way to say it. And there's 900 students in this class. The professor in charge of this class, and that's not all in one lecture. That's in four different lectures of 270 people each. All these other support systems. The um, professor in charge of that sent out a signal to students within a day. He was swamped with over 100 students coming to his office hour to come in and say, hey, um, what can we do to help work on this? Because 
And he was able to give him really positive feedback and suggestions to say, this seems to be what you're struggling with. So it's an amazing thing for doing that, for, for looking at where students are doing in a class. Other questions? OK. So I also want to encourage the development of interpersonal skills. Well, I can't evaluate that directly. But what I can say is if I'm having my students work in teams, which I was, I can have them evaluate how well they think their team is doing, as well as how well individuals are doing. And the way that I would actually do this is peer evalu evaluation. And there's this program called CATME, C-A-T-M-E. CATME is this great program. I'm going to talk more about it during my session on lecture-based, um, active learning lecture-based classes and student-centered classes. Because what it allows you to do is, and I did this with 900 students, I formed them into teams of four during, for the recitations. And the way I formed the teams is I said, I didn't just go, you're one, you're two, you're three, you're four. You know, I didn't do that. I wanted students to be uh, have, come in, you know, you come in with a different knowledge base, where they're at, who are better. I wanted to have a, a um, heterogeneous thing in terms of introductory incoming knowledge. Some students might be better at this, some might be other than that. I also was looking at, and I can do that, you can do that with a system where you import their GPAs or their uh, do you guys have standardized tests that they take before they enter uh, the university? Do that. You can do all these things to do as this pre thing. And I also, because I was dealing with science, a science course, the number of males to female students within the science course was 80% male, 20% female. So we know that if you have a team and you have three men and one woman, one woman, or three women and one man, it doesn't work for anybody. Well, three men and one woman, it doesn't work. It works just fine for the guys, but it doesn't work for the woman. And the thing is, how do we actually have to figure this out and balance it? Well, you can say, do not let the, this happen. We had a unique problem at Purdue when I was doing this that um, Purdue had, was announced that year as um, having the number two highest population of international students of any public university in the country, in the US. Now they're down to number four, but it's still large students. So what that actually translates to for our engineering physics course, of that 900 students that come into that course, 40% of them are international students. So what do you think happens if I say, OK, I want to have three typically Chinese students and one domestic student work in a group together? What's the problem that can happen? Cultural things, uh, also exclusionary. The three Chinese can work together and exclude. The American student, we had that happen. Um, one of the things that's interesting about that is back working for this course, um, the, um, we had, when the TAs formed the group, they'd often have this three international students to one domestic student. And they at least tried to not do three international males to one domestic female. Um, that's like a nightmare thing. Uh, but anyway, what they did is they formed these groups. And so what did the international students do? If they all were from the same country, they just worked together. They ignored the other person. So one of the things I had to say is, OK, we cannot have international students dominate over domestic, and we can't have domestic students dominate over, over international. Sort of the same thing we do with male and female students, we're doing now with domestic, in domestic versus international students. So to be able to set up these groups, I use this CATME tool. 900 students. First year I did it, it took me 50 hours to form the groups for both the recitations and the labs. It's a lot of work. I done it with my groups of 100 students, it wasn't that much work, an hour or so. Multiply that by two separate we had to do both labs and recitation. Then um, I just used CATME. I did it the next year. It took me three hours. And that includes sending out a survey for them to fill out, different things like that. I mean, it was not hard to do it. For, sorry. Um, but one of the things, the other thing CATME allows you to do is allow your, does some really detailed and has done a lot of research on how you can do peer evaluation of teams. And you can study by the focus of what teams, how the kind of responses are happening, 
things like that. You can identify functioning teams, well-functioning teams, and poorly functioning teams. Like, they're actually able to say, okay, this person is dominating the conversation. This is, they look for the patterns, they say, this is what we expect to see if they're dominating. And so this cat me tool, um, again, I'll get the website to you guys tomorrow, uh, or give it to Monica, who will make it available through her office, that the cat me tool allows you to be able to do that and actually take a lot of that stress and strain and allow you to evaluate things. So I would do peer evaluation and teachings. Then I talked about reasoning skills, same as I did before, and technology skills. I'm like, hmm, I still was confused what I wanted to do. Really not sure. Okay. And didn't know. Okay. Whew, I've been talking a long time. Are you guys all bored and are you sleeping? Is anybody sleeping? We all hate lecture. Oh, shush. Shush, shush. I'm hearing yes, so I'm thinking somebody really is bored. No, it's not. Okay. What I want you to do is get into your teams of three. Again, for those of you who do not attend the first session, each one of these uh, tables is, has nine chairs around it. And the idea is that you can work in three groups of three. And so what I want you to do is work in these groups of three, like the back table, we're good to go. This one, we need one person up here. We, need, we have one extra person here. Maybe you can come over here. Three. One person extra here. Uh, two, 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 two. We have, need one person here. So I think we have just the right number of persons. So if somebody can come over to this table with, there is one extra person there. And one, and then also, so we want you guys to work in groups of three. And what I want you guys to do is start coming up with what is your, excuse me, um, what is you think your primary goal is? What is your primary course goal? What do you really want students to do? There will be, um, there will be bonus points for creativity on what your number one top goal is. Then I want you to think about how you would actually, how you want to evaluate. What evidence would you collect to do it? Okay, to give you guys some practice doing this. We need another volunteer over at this table. We have an extra student over there. I'm sorry I'm calling you guys students because you're all workshop percent. Yes, a minute. Okay, I guess we're going to have some groups working with two. That's okay. You have to be, um, but yes, go, go, go. Yes, good. You have to be flexible on these kind of things. So are you not working in a group? Okay. Why don't you two hook up with them and you have four of you work together? Um, I prefer four students working together whenever I form teams, just because that way you can have two men, two women, two international, two domestic. Um, but the other thing is, is it's so that, um, but unfortunately with the scale up classrooms, it's a little hard to do the four team. But you're going to be fine, but. Yes, you can choose whatever. I, I don't care which subject you do, because you might find there's one overarching goal that you all have for your class. Even if you're teaching totally different subjects, you might have different... In engineering design, for freshman engineering, it's more how to figure out how to solve a complex real-world problem and optimize your solution based on certain constraints. Like, okay, you can only spend this much money, or you can only do this, or there's a restriction that you can't work in, say you can't, you have to work west of the Mississippi. I'm just giving an example. You know, so it's just sort of like looking at how, what is that the design process you're talking about, what engineering design process. It's going, being able to optimize. So you might want to spell it out a little bit more specifically. Gotcha. One of the things here yeah, is to make it the very. Process, you can have conceptualization, you can have prototyping, you can have validation, then you can have commercialization. So you could assess each one of those separately. Which we actually don't go through all of them in that course. We typically will stay in conceptual conceptualization phase and prototyping and validation, but we don't take it to a commercialization provider. No, but one thing I've seen people do is they start with that. Yeah. And then sometimes they have some teams who decide to come back oh, yeah. and do that as a senior project. And so you could actually focus on that as consider, considering this research design 
senior project, Capstone Experience. Exactly. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yes. Okay. First, and share their overarching one, one. Each team can say one primary course goal, and it can be from any of the courses that the um, group members are from or team members are from. And I want you to discuss how you would evaluate and what evidence you will collect. Okay, so who wants to, what team wants to go first? Oh, if I could do it and stay on my feet. Yay! I spin around like a whirling dervish if I could do it. If I can't. Hold on. Yeah. It's better in response. My English is not so good. Okay. Okay. Um, yo tengo un curso en ingeniería y diseño de producto que se llama materiales en el diseño y en las primeras cinco semanas el objetivo es que los estudiantes aprendan a leer una hoja técnica de propiedades de los materiales, entiendan el significado de esas propiedades y cómo usarlas. Ese es el objetivo. ¿Cómo se evalúa? Se evalúa al final del curso con notas abiertas se les entrega un producto fabricado en dos o tres materiales diferentes y se les pide que comparen las propiedades de esos materiales en los que está fabricado ese producto y lo expliquen con sus palabras qué significa. Y cómo se mide la evidencia es que ese, esa, esa información se necesita para comprender después los otros objetos de conocimiento de la materia. Entonces, todo el tiempo se está preguntando por el tema y se hace retroalimentación y si no lo recuerdan, pues vuelve y se les hace, se les explica qué es lo que, lo que tienen que entender. Pero ellos, una vez ven el trabajo pues, que se ha hecho en las primeras cinco semanas, eh, uno ve el progreso porque se utilizan unas herramientas pedagógicas en cada clase al principio para que sea más fácil para ellos entender ese tema de ingeniería que a veces es pesado y complejo de una manera más simple, con metáforas y analogías. Ok, muy bien, eso es una muy buena idea. Quiero mencionar algo que mencioné a otro grupo que hablaba de ingenieros. Esta idea de scaffolding con instrucción. Para los que hacen instrucción que es bastante complicada, o cosas así, donde piensas que es demasiado difícil para los estudiantes hacer, o demasiado difícil, this idea of scaffolding is sort of, scaffolding is in terms of uh, the building materials. Like, so if you build a building, you have a structure that surrounds it that supports the building, and as the building gets more stable and more stable, you take away the scaffolding because the building doesn't need it too much. So scaffolding in student instruction is very similar to this. So sometimes you need to guide students a little bit more when they're first starting out. And what happens is this idea a scaffolding is you start pulling away how much you're contributing and starting to go from maybe 70% instructor guided down to like maybe 10 or 20% instructor and the students are guiding the thing. So it sort of just is a representation of how this, um, it actually can happen and occur in a classroom. So I wanted to share that with you and that's a good example of scaffolding that you have here. Okay, another group. I'm going to start calling on a physicist if you're not careful. They told me they were physicists. Yes. So these are, this is a goal for a constitution class. It's an intro introductory course. Uh, the goal would be to know what the students' rights are and how they can defend them, like the defense mechanisms that they have. And it would be evaluated with students being given some real life cases where they have to identify what the right that's being violated is and where they have to choose between different defense mechanisms to appeal to this right. And then the evidence that we would collect is the, a written paper where students, well, where, where students describe the, the right that's being violated, the defense mechanism, and we then the, they're using that the adequate vocabulary. Okay, that's a good one. Um, now, do you say U.S. Constitution? No. No, cons just Constitution. Okay, because I'm like going wait. <laughs> I realized I was putting my influ my I was putting translating in my head, and I'm like, 
OK, and then I realized, wait, you could just be talking about any constitution, not just that. OK, other, other groups who want to talk about what they? I think you volunteered. <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> Should I call on the physicists? What do you guys think? Should I? Maybe the engineer is back there. Call somebody randomly in the back there. You guys want to talk about what you're doing? Uh, yes, who's being pointed at? Yes. So wait for the microphone. We need a microphone in the back. Mm. Pass it over to the woman okay. in pink back there. Eh, nuestro trabajo fue alrededor del curso de mecánica de fluidos y su laboratorio. Es en ingeniería. El objetivo que planteamos es el empleo de los conceptos básicos de mecánica de fluidos en forma sistemática, sistémica. La evaluación es a través de eh, la selección de los modelos que se aplican, el desarrollo de casos prácticos y proyectos de curso. Y las evidencias están alrededor de los informes técnicos, las inferencias y argumentaciones y conclusiones y la valoración que pedimos en forma económica del proyecto que hicieron. That's all. Um, one thing I would say is that's a great idea, and I think this idea when you're talking about we're co collecting evidence, we're wanting the students to do these reports, the students are doing these things. One of the things you can do is create a portfolio, sort of like where you keep everything for in your class. Here's examples of my student work. Here's examples of the exams they, they did. Here are the projects they did. Here are the papers they wrote. These are examples. This again can use as evidence when people are wondering how do I know what you did worked? Because you know, if you come up with just an idea and you stand in front of an audience and say, oh, by the way, this is what you should do, and you don't have an actual legitimate reason for doing it, or does anybody believe what you're doing and why you're doing it is actually working? This thing you remember. So that's good. And did you guys have something in the back there? Thank you. OK. Uh, Bueno, eh, nosotros como hay dos de idiomas y matemáticas, eh, juntamos eso en una sola idea y es un curso que pensamos es de elementos básicos, bien sea de lenguaje o bien sea de matemáticas. Y en ambos eh, un, el objetivo uno o el objetivo principal es utilizar los elementos del lenguaje, bien sea que estemos enseñando inglés o estemos enseñando matemáticas, hay un lenguaje que, que el estudiante tiene que aprender. Y ante eso, eh, una de las… es romper el miedo en el estudiante, ¿sí? cosa que no podemos evaluar o, o medir si, si está perdiendo o no el miedo a, a esos nuevos elementos pero que en el tiempo se podría ir evidenciando si hay un progreso en que está rompiendo el miedo a través de su participación en la clase. En matemáticas sí se podría medir, digámoslo así, de manera… Eh, eh, las evidencias a partir de si el estudiante es capaz de plantear la solución de, de un problema de análisis a partir de definiciones y conceptos, no solamente eh, si es capaz de traducir, digamos, porque una cosa es que sea capaz del lenguaje de, del común llevarlo a la matemática o del lenguaje del común llevarlo al inglés en el caso de ellas, sino también si es capaz de analizar eh, pequeñas eh, cosas de, de uno de los dos idiomas. Ya está. One thing I, um, I'd like to compliment you on that, noticing, finding the, the parallel between mathematics and language arts. 
One thing I would say, uh, what's ironic about this is my astronomy class that I told you about a few minutes ago, I had an activity where te groups worked and teams worked in groups, teams of four worked on it, and we did this, I had an activity called Mathematics, a Language of Science. Because when teaching for physicists or engineering or some things, and sometimes when I'm dealing with non-technical majors, you have to teach mathematics as a language. And so I do appreciate that and see that, so I appreciate that. And I think it's good to be thinking, what do I do? What can I evaluate? How can I make these similarities happen? Um, at a former university I was at, we used to have to do these integrated courses, where you'd have two very separate courses, like foreign language and mathematics. And you would actually te team teach it as a specialized course in the language of mathematics or something like that, and teach it like a language. So that's a possible idea for something, because it is something you could actually do and would be of interest to people. And they might really enjoy the course because they're paralleling. Because people that are good at foreign languages, I'm not good at foreign languages, excuse me. But, or those that are good at mathematics, I am good at mathematics, can start seeing how we break that down, how we do the things. Okay, other questions, other comments, other sharing? Okay, we have a sharing over here. Bueno, gracias. Acá analizamos un curso del área de finanzas que se llama gestión financiera de largo plazo. Eh, si bien el, el objetivo primario es que los estudiantes realicen proyecciones financieras, presupuestos y determinen si la idea de inversión va a generar la rentabilidad adecuada para la empresa y agregar valor, el proceso inicia con la identificación de las ideas que pueden surgir de dos formas, una es motivarlos para que ellos emprendan sus propios negocios, lo que va a ser como un plan de vida hacia el futuro, que algunos desarrollan incluso dentro de la universidad, o también eh, realizándose en análisis estratégicos de las empresas ya eh, existentes donde determinan oportunidades de inversión. Para pasar a una breve descripción y análisis de lo que son los distintos estudios, eh, que serían como la materia prima para brindar la información que se va a cuantificar en términos de pesos. Estos estudios pues, son las diferentes disciplinas, legal, el mercadeo, lo social, lo económico, lo técnico, eh, y en ese sentido pues ya eh, puede participarse a través de los conocimientos previos que tienen de asignaturas, como también compartir con expertos que les hablen de cada uno de los temas para que ellos eh, miren cómo han sido evaluadas algunas ideas en empresas diferentes. Con, ese, eh, con toda esta información, entonces, eh, ya se pasa a lo que es eh, definir cuál va a ser el modelo de negocio a seguir y se va a hacer la cuantificación ya financiera para llegar entonces a las capacidades de los muchachos que se van a evaluar a través de si son capaces de construir un flujo de caja, determinar los costos de inversión, los costos de operación, los resultados y los distintos indicadores que la empresa definirá eh, qué tan viable financieramente es y a cuál de las múltiples ideas que se deben desarrollar, tratarlas de seleccionar en orden de una priorización o jerarquía. Hierarchy, okay. Anyway, so one of the questions I had for you is, okay, that's a great plan. That sounds like a really great idea. Let's do this. Let's take, okay, how are you going to, what is your goal that's associated with this plan? And how are you going to evaluate the goal? Because it seems like a very good instructional plan and what you could implement in your classroom. But what is the goal of doing that? What is like an overarching goal? Básicamente es mirar la estructuración de los estudios en un primer plano, cómo han sido definidos eh, la viabilidad del mercado, eh, a qué nicho va a ir. Eh, cuál es el precio que podrán vender, con quién se van a enfrentar en el mercado, competidores actuales, proveedores, todos los agentes con los que se van a relacionar y hacer toda la estructura de costos. Para el de tener la meta final de que sean capaces de destinar unos recursos escasos de cualquier eh, empresa por las múltiples cantidades de ideas que hay para definir en dónde van a invertir. So what I'm seeing is your goal is that in this course is after the course, students will be able to um, learn how to distribute limited resources to do this. So that's the goal, that they should be able to do this. And as evidence of this goal, you're actually going to see these semester projects or end of the things, projects that you're having them do. And you're going to assess how well they're mastering these concepts 
and then saying, this is evidence of that I have met my goal, because my students have been able to do this. Is that, is that a fair? Yeah, okay. So that is a good way of looking at it. And again, you just have to sometimes spell this out. And I mean, hopefully this process, I wanted to give you an introduction to this idea of what's going on with this. To see, hopefully it's now saying, oh, I can do this with my course. Has anybody thought of doing this kind of exercise with their course before? Do you see how it could be beneficial to your students and to you guys? Yeah, nod and just keep nodding, yeah. <laughs> All right, I want to go over a few more things. I know we're wrapping up. This is a big question. So you spend, you spend like a semester or maybe two working with this course and planning this course out that you're going to create. And then you spend the semester teaching it. And you design the evaluation plan. And everything goes up. And what happens if it's not actually meeting the goals that you had for it? What if it, does, it says your course did not work? What do you do and how can you start accounting for that? And what things can you go from forward there? How can you move forward? So my first thing to say is, we'll start looking at it. We have to investigate what are possible things that could have affected my evaluation results. And start doing this in a scholarly manner. Like what you guys did here where you're starting the goals and what you're going to do to evaluate it, and the evidence you provide is how thinking about it in a scholarly manner. So um, one of the possible causes of poor performance is to talk about a few of them. Issues. Students do not perform as well as you would like. I, from this morning's thing, we had a lot of people who were saying they're disappointed, that they wish their students would perform better, and that they could ask them more difficult questions and do such things. You know, like we all remember that we were able to do when we were in college. You know, everybody was able to teach more courses. So a possible cause is this is where we get back to this disconnect idea. There's a disconnect between what you are teaching and what students are learning. Why is that happening? What is going on? And you have to think about this in a very thought, thoughtful manner. So one way is like you can start reading up on the research of how students learn. How do students learn in general and how do students learn a specific type of course as you're teaching? You've got math and language. How do they learn language? How does that compare to how they learn math? There's lots of research out there on that. Also, you might want to spend more time Less time lecturing and more time in the student center format because as we learned in the first activity or first workshop I did this morning, we want to focus on student learning. Student, student centered classes are much more effective and more students on average can get the content that you want to get across. So let's spend some more time. Are there activities you can design that do a better job? What's going on? Um, here's one students do not like working in groups or teams. The number one thing that employers in the U.S. request for their future employees is its ability to work in teams. How to effectively work in teams and how to learn to work together and communicate together. I'm not sure if that's the case here in uh, Colombia, but I do know it's a big issue in the U.S. And so I can see it spreading out from there. I would assume more people would ask for that skill. So if they don't like doing the teams, what's happening? Well. Some students say, well, this is just group work. We did, and this may be a U.S. thing. This is just group work. We did group work in high school. I hated group work. I always had to do all the work. Do you all remember feeling like that at some point? Is this like a universal thing, not just a U.S. thing? Okay, good to know. Um, and other things, students don't know how to work in teams. That's part of it gets back on the, well, it didn't work for them when they worked in groups because they didn't know how to work in teams. They didn't sort of figure out how, how can I... Um, delegate tasks? How can we work as a team and try and get meet these goals? And so maybe you need to do some more um, education on how to do teamwork. One of the other things I found that works nicely is creating semi-permanent teams. You can't have a team come in here and have, say you're teaching this classroom and students can sit wherever, so they can sit with their friends or what's, what not, and say so-and-so wants to work in a different team and they just switch top, you know, people just move around the room and you do not get, you don't get this, they haven't learned to work together. It takes time to learn to work together. And we're going to talk, I think all of us are going to talk a little bit about teamwork tomorrow in our breakout activities, because that's a key thing that sort of all the different things about active learning, I'll probably talk about it in the uh, first one on active learning tomorrow. 
Um, what I say is do not refer to them as groups, but rather as teams, because in the United States, they hate groups. Hate, 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 hate. All right, other things. Say they don't like something about the course. They really hate your PowerPoint slides, or they really hate the fact that you um, have them go to, um, you have to go to the language lab in practice, or you have to actually go out there and measure and work with real engineering materials, or fluid dynamics. You know, you have to go out and take some measurements. Um, they don't like it. So what's happening is you got to sort of say, you need to clarify why we're doing what we're doing. Be open and honest and frame, when I say introduce and frame it, it's sort of saying, this is what we're doing here. This is why we're doing it. Letting them know what is going on. Don't just assume they're going to realize what's happening because they're not. They're not you. They're not professionals yet. They have to be scaffolded up to be able to figure out how to do this work. And so, and then also I say let them know as quickly as possible. Like for example, I use integrated lab and teamwork in my class, or excuse me, integrated lab and lecture in my course I did the syllabus for. Now I should say I didn't do that at first. For the first five years I taught it, I said this is group work, you probably haven't worked in cooperative groups before, this is this, we're going to work in groups together and you're going to learn. And a lot of them felt that it was like kindergarten. You know, I was like an elementary school teacher saying, okay, we're going to all work in groups and we'll be happy, smiley people. Um, well, what ended up happening is, I said, okay, we got to do teamwork. And I said, all right, what do I know about teamwork? Well, they have to have individual responsibility and group responsibility for the team. So I started saying, all right, let's form team contracts. Let them make their own contracts. And that way, if one person in the team violates the contract, the other three people can fire them. Also, things like, um, you know, they could also say things with the teams that if they were not um, actually keeping track of things and saying, okay, this is why we're doing what we're doing, it may not actually go through and they have to figure out how to do these things. So when you frame the course and let them know, but, I used, but when I dropped the group work and made it go into integrated lap and lecture and say just an astronomy course with group work, the students loved it. They absolutely loved it. My teaching evaluation, end of semester teaching evaluation, this is nearly unheard of. When ranking four out of five, I mean, you have five responses, so the responses could go from zero to five, basically a one to five. Um, I was able to raise my teaching evaluations by 0.75 points across the board. If anybody's tried to raise their teaching evaluation, this is nearly unheard of because I reframed the course. Now, I made a few other changes too. Okay, some students, when they come in, they do not want to do student center course. Why? Because it's harder. What's easier to do? You sit back, you're in the back of the lecture hall, you're sitting back, you've got your iPhone or your smartphone or whatever thing you're doing. You're like watching some video while the professor's talking and you're like, well, I'm here, I'm learning, I'm learning, I've got this covered. Learning is hard. Students oftentimes do not realize how hard it is to learn. But I bet each one of you can tell me how hard it is to learn because you've all been through a situation where it's been hard for you to learn. We don't make it to this level without having been through it. So be aware of that. Uh, I want to talk about um, uh, things that actually happen when they only learn with lecture. You might actually say, well, this is what we're doing. This is how I'm assessing you. Uh, provide students with sample exams and provide feedback on how they are doing. So if they are not doing well in the course, I mean, a lot of students Turns out that students that are not as well prepared and are going to be poor scores on exams, they're overconfident in their ability to complete an exam successfully. So if you're having this happen, the students are going to be overconfident in the ability, they go into the exam and they don't do so well. Now if your student is male, the male student will be like, oh, that instructor didn't give me a fair exam, bleep, 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 bleep and do that. But if it's a female student, they tend to be more likely to internalize it. I didn't do something right. I should have known better. I should have memorized the information better. And this sometimes can produce, at least in programs like the STEM fields where they are male dominated in a lot of cases, can be an anti-effect towards women continuing in the sciences and other STEM fields. And I think that's the last slide. So we should have 10 minutes for questions. That is the last slide. Okay. 
So, one thing I want to talk about to you one last little bit is this thing called expectation violation. Your students, when they come into your class, have an expectation of how this course is going to go. For example, they come into my physics course, and they're in a lecture hall. I walk in. This actually happened. I walked into my first semester teaching at Kansas State University. I was young. It's like 15 years ago, more. Actually, 18 years ago. Um, walk in there, and some people said, you're not what I expected. I expected a fuzzy-haired physicist. You don't have any fuzzy-haired physicists here. An Einstein-like figure, if you would. <laughs> and we talk about stereotypes, and it turns out because they had this expectation violation. And then I started throwing group work at them. And they were like, this is too much like high school. She's not a physics, she doesn't look like a physics professor. I mean, it was really interesting, this class, because I had people, students come over and talk, talk to me afterwards. Like, half the, there was supposed to be this German older man, fuzzy-haired physicist, teaching the course. And the um, half the students who came in were like, He's not this old German, hard to understand, physicist teaching this course. It's a younger woman. She, she speaks English. This is great. I can't wait to have her teach my class. Tend to be those are mostly females. And then the male students in the class were like, not all the males, but some of the students were like, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. I didn't look like a stereotypical physicist. And you're laughing because, I mean, I'm just saying this kind of thing happens. But, but students come in. If your students come into your class and expect to be in a lecture, and you're breaking that mold, you got to be really careful, and you have to actually acknowledge their expectations, be aware of it, and provide evidence of why their expectations aren't necessarily going to be, are not really appropriate in a course like this. So, for example, in the sciences, a friend of ours does this thing where he talks about expectation violation, and he does this whole thing about where he reads about how to learn to dance. You know, the lecture on how to learn dance. And they say, okay, you know all how to do dance now. And the students are all going, no, I don't know how to dance. Because you don't learn dance by me telling you how to dance. Do you? you learn dance by having been shown and practice and practice and practice. And it's the same thing for science. And so that's one thing. Or it's the same thing for a lot of your different fields. Because we all have this key component of practice involved. I'm looking at foreign languages going, yes, all this time spent in the language lab, listening. I just remember these things from college, and it's like, ugh. Anyway, so that was one thing. Uh, OK, so let's open it up to some questions. I'm going to start turning around. I know it's 425, and we all are 420. Yes? You were discussing between the two ideas of, uh, as Gilberto asked, when we should define the objectives of, let's say, learning, and when do we need to do these kind of objectives from the instructor to the course? Because this, uh, this session, for me, is more towards uh, research in education. I mean, uh, I'm going to implement something. I need to collect the evidence to see if they improved or not. Uh, so that's my perspective, but I'm not sure if I'm correct. Or it's well, not it's not really pure education research. It is collecting evidence to support your ideas. What it is is saying, hey, do I know? Because I don't know about you guys, but I want to know if what I'm doing and trying is working or not. Because if it's not working, I want to improve it. Because I really can say about my learning. Some of the things, like we do the primary trait analysis, and you go through and you, we actually found uh, in the physics course at Purdue that one of the issues was you know, at the end of the semester, we get to um, angular momentum. And they weren't spending very much on it, so they're asking these really easy questions. And all of a sudden, the students are scoring much better because the questions weren't the same difficulty as the other course ex questions on the exams. And so, OK, you're really doing, you're doing them a disservice by doing these really easy questions and then throwing really hard questions on them on the final. So that was part of the thing. So yeah, you want to be, so it's not necessarily, it's for your own edification that we're asking these questions. But the other thing is, is because you have to be accountable, we're all accountable to somebody. Mm -hmm. There's evaluation to, you know, you're going to be accountable to your department head. You might be accountable to why you be, should be spending, why you should be funded to do these innovative projects. How do I get money to do these things? And you have to be able to justify it. And that's where it's coming. So it's not pure education research, but it is research on your education practice. That's why it's a scholarship of teaching and learning. Thank you. Yes. Other questions? 
Sorry. Yes. Um, my question is regarding the time and the, the necessity we have like to cover a lot of topics and to get a schedule because as, as I see this kind of active learning demands a lot of time with the students and we have like a, a, a course full of topics and full of things to teach. So how do you deal with it? How do you deal with uh, taking advantage of the short times you have uh, of uh, sessions? Well, one of the things is, let's focus on the thing, is by focusing on what the students truly need your help with. So somebody I met earlier today was talking about doing a flip classroom. Are you still here doing the flip classroom? Are you doing the flip classroom? OK, flip classroom is you have the students participate in the lectures outside of class. They watch lectures on video or doing something like that. They then have to fill out some quizzes or do some things to see if they master the content from the videos. And then they come into class, and rather than have the lecture regurgitated, them regurg sorry, repeat what the book said. I mean, I realized my very first day of college that I didn't have to go. I could either read the book or go to class, but I didn't have to do both because it was just a restating of everything in the textbook. And so people are nodding their heads. They're saying, yeah, I remember that. And the thing is, is that that kind of, you know, being able to say, OK, I want to hear, be here and learn. Not be passive learners, but be active learners. And that is how we're going to start talking about. So sometimes you have to make sacrifices. What do I need them to be actively doing? That's when they should be doing it with me. What can I have them learn outside of class? or do outside that they aren't going to need me as an instructor, therefore? And what are some solutions? Like with the scale of classrooms that Jeff is going to talk about tomorrow, one of the things he's going to talk about is how they don't do a lot of lecture in these courses. My activity classes, I don't do a lot of lecture. You know, I'm doing more lecture today than I had in some of the courses I teach. Because I wanted to be able to get a lot. Anytime you want to get a large amount of information over in a shorter period of time, you lecture. But sometimes. You also have to know, understand how difficult it is to understand the material. Because if this is really, really super complex contents, like, oh yeah, doing the um, evaluation table, I had you actually do an activity to practice it and to get sort of some ideas of how to answer these questions. And so that's what comes into play a bit. OK? Yes. So say that. What I had tried to do in a class, I, I felt that I had missed the mark in a bad way. What then? Should I share that with my colleagues? Should I ask to teach the same course again because so that I can look? You can improve. Because I've learned some, say. I've learned a lot from that experiment. Um, in my personal experience, it varies by the situation you're in. I was in a course where my um, that I got some evaluations. So it wasn't looking like it was working how I wanted to do it to go. And people were sort of saying, oh, well, this is a really easy course to teach. Here's this guy who has to memorize all this information. The students like it so much better. Where she's actually having them deal with concepts and things we wouldn't think they'd, she'd be able to do. And so why is she trying so hard to just memorize the data, get good teaching evaluations, and go on? You know, so it depends on who your peers are and who your department head is. Um, and who the people you're going to be talking to. So sometimes you have to branch outside your university. Sometimes you have to branch outside your course or your department. Uh, one of the things uh, this brings up that tomorrow I'm going to be talking about this, hopefully setting up this faculty development um, group on a, a website that allow us to have group dynamics. This course it's very similar to Facebook, but it's working for academically based for Facebook. And it gives you a chance to share these concerns with people. So you could share it with this group of people that you're more, in a sense, a little bit more anonymous. But get that feedback that you need and having people sort of say the things. Because we all need that stuff. We shouldn't just quit when we have a bad result. You know, you should work with people. So Sorry. I have a comment. Oh, OK. I'm so shy. Uh, because it's important uh, to share your which you believe to be your failures with your colleagues as well. Mm -hmm. That has, is also very valuable for them. Yes, it is. Some, fa some, depending on who the person is, they can judge you inappropriately for it and hold it against you. And so you have, you have to decide if you feel comfortable. I mean, it is important that it be shared, 
but in some cases, you don't want it to be held against you in promotion and tenure. Okay, other questions? Yes, Jeff. More of a comment. Um, best piece of advice I can probably give you when you're attempting this, and this is sort of building on what uh, Lana, what Lana was saying, was um, try not to do this alone. Try and find some colleagues, either with faculty development group or hopefully with your, hopefully more within your department, and work together, bounce ideas off each other, and it's amazing how much better you can feel about that when you're not feel like so you don't have that feeling that you're all alone. It's sort of you you against the world, or you against your class, um, and you'll find that those types of change, those types of innovations, tend to last longer because more than one person in the department knows about it. You feel better doing it because you're, 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 if something goes wrong, you're not, you, have, you can talk to other people and not be quite as discouraged. And that will help uh, drive your innovations and maybe give you an, enough push so that when th if things don't quite go as well as you would like, you still have an incentive to move forward and try and, and try and improve things, make things better in the future. And the other piece of advice I would give is sometimes there are some people who are very dynamic, like Rebecca, and she can tell her students things and they believe her. Not really. Beginning. Not really. Okay. Not really. So one thing I did on expectations that I hadn't heard, but you might want to try, it won't work at first, but after you build up a body of students who've had your class in the past, one of the things I started doing is I noticed I would tell my students things on the first day of class, and they seemed very surprised when we actually do them a few weeks later. So what I did was I got a collection of my, my old students, those students I know who actually liked what I did, um, and I would bring them to class on the first day of class, and I would let the new students have a Q&A, a question and answer session with them for about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of class. And while they didn't necessarily listen to me, they did listen to my former students. And I think you may find your students are the same. Okay, I'd like to wrap up. Wonderful uh, discussion today, wonderful more. So tomorrow we're gonna get into more of this how, because I know a lot of people are going, how do I do this? Okay, I know this thing, I know about it, I know these things, but I want to do this tomorrow. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe next week or next semester, but I want to do this. I want to figure out what it is that I want to do. So we're going to actually go into what we call active learning that is closely related to student-centered teaching because what the reason it's student-centered teaching is because it allows the students to be more active learners as opposed to passive recipients of knowledge. They now are actively learning, trying to create their own knowledge, and going beyond that. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow. We'll be meeting at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. I believe we're meeting in this room. And then in the afternoon, we're doing the breakout sessions, one here in this room in the scale-up room, one that is going to be in the lecture hall, and one that is going to be in more of a um, multi-purpose classroom where they have these wonderful chairs. They sometimes are lined up together so it's like a lecture hall and they can break up into group work. I mean, I really wanted that. I want that as a classroom. I don't, I, the round tables are nice and there are a lot of advantages to it, but in the kind of classrooms I've taught in, we haven't, a lot of universities and a lot of departments don't want to go and invest all this money on these beautiful technology. So it's like you can sometimes get things like chairs, so you can figure that out and it's really cool. All right, I'll see you guys all tomorrow morning, hopefully.